Amartya Sen from the Harvard Department of Economics and Philosophy. Um, I know time is very short, but I do want to take a minute before I get on with my arguments to say how very much I enjoyed reading the manuscript. Um, I was reading it in the, over the summer in the Italian beaches, in Sassi in particular. <laughs> it was wonderful to have Ronnie's argumentative presence on those uh, otherwise diverting sites in the, in the, on the sea. <laughs> uh, he and I used to teach a class together along with Derek Parfit and later Jerry Cohen in Oxford for about 10 years. And I think at the end of it, I remember discussing whether we ever agreed or not. Uh, it wasn't quite clear that we did. Uh, I have to say I agree with a lot of the things that Ronnie says, though again, following the tradition here, I'm going to concentrate on the ones where I don't. Anyway, to get on with it, um, Dawkins says what he calls the hydraulic principle, to the delight of the childhood engineer in us all, denies responsibility, quote, if either determinism or epiphenomenalism is true. Of the two, it's a claim of a conflict between determinism and responsibility that is more engaging. Dawkins' dismissal of the reach of epiphenomenalism in this context is swift and seems to me to be largely compelling. The tussle with determinism is more, is more substantial. But Dawkins' presentation is enlightening in going over a large ground with care, even though the central ground is close to David Hume's reasoning. I think Tim has already mentioned that. Um, that outside causes may explain our judgment, and yet they do not make our judgment less genuine as our judgment, or less important for assessing responsibility, and indeed for such issues as fatalism. This is a subject of some nostalgia for me, in fact, even a much longer nostalgia than, uh, than uh, Ronnie's and my class together, since in my first philosophical essay, published exactly 50 years ago today in 1959, I tried to chastise Isaiah Berlin for his belief that determinism makes the idea of moral responsibility entirely unviable. Berlin was extremely gracious in his longest reply in the introduction to his four essays of liberty without agreeing with me, and I can't say without fully exactly representing my argument, but he, but, but he was extremely gracious. But the, 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 the main bulk of the point that he was trying to make is very similar to one of the points that Robert Kane uh, mentioned here. I am actually a compatibilist, so I'm not on Kane's and Berlin's side, I'm on Dawkins and Hume's side. Um, I think what uh, the the point that I was making was not uh, new since um, Hume had made that, and in this sense, that particular aspect of Ronnie's point is not new either. What Ronnie does beautifully uh, in this very classic um, compatibilist position is to bring out the richness of the counter-arguments that have to be addressed to make a more complete picture that corresponds to Hume's rather rapid reasoning. I find Dworkin's discussion to be both illuminating and persuasive, even though I would argue that giving more room for the diverse implications of mental pathology, and I had a little bit that I'm skipping because I think Anita has already discussed some of the points I was going to raise. My main difficulty, and I turn to those now, with Ronnie Dawkins' reasoning about ethical responsibility concerns his principle of quote-unquote self-respect. I quote, each person must accept that it's a matter of importance that his life be a successful performance rather than a wasted opportunity, unquote. And, quote, unquote, authenticity, quote, each person has a special personal responsibility for identifying what counts as success in his own life. He has a personal responsibility to create that life through a coherent narrative that he himself has chosen and endorses, unquote. Let me go along with Ronnie to the extent of agreeing that a person is not acting responsibly if he leads his life in a way that he himself would have compelling reasons to judge to be wasted opportunity if he were to consider reasoning about them. And also that a person 
has some responsibilities to decide what quote unquote counts as success in his own life. However, my problems remain, remain even after this broad agreement. I consider four possibly, four possibly irresponsible persons in the Dworkin framework. Consider first Anne, who thinks that there are good reasons for her to value either a life of type A, respectful and conservative on traditional matters without hurting anyone's feelings or of type B, being radically contemporary and reshaping lives, including her own, in a way that would give adequate recognition to what modern scientific knowledge could offer. Anne will have no problem with Ronnie if she proceeds from there to decide that one of these lives, A or B, would be distinctly better than the other. But suppose she does not come to that conclusion, but continues to believe that even though life A and life B are each better than confused living without adequate thought on what should count as success in her life, she has a reasoned incompleteness in ranking A and B against each other. Given this partial ranking, and this partial ranking does not reflect a lack of reasoning, but in fact is the result of detail, detailed reasoning, it would seem to me responsible for Anne to pursue either lifestyle. Will Ronnie accept this? If Ronnie's answer is fine, that's okay, then I would like to see more recognition of the possibility and indeed far-reaching implications of choice according to partial ranking, a subject that interested John Dewey very much and indeed Adam Smith too. The case, of course, would be unproblematic by the way, and I ought to mention, because quite often there is a tendency, there's a little bit, sometimes even in Ronnie, to think that, to say that either of these answers, either of these would be permissible things, is somewhat similar to saying there's no right answer. I mean, if there's no right answer to the wrong question. I mean, if you answer what is uniquely the right thing to do, well, then there is no right, right answer to that. But if you don't cook the question and ask what would be the right thing to do, then to say either, uh, your, uh, 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 either of them would be the right thing to do is a perfectly fine answer. It's not a, it's not a no right answer. The case, will, of course, would be unproblematic with what may look like a small variation. It isn't actually small, though. In particular, if Anne found that A or B are equally good and each would equally make her life a success. In that case, Ronnie should, and I believe would, allow Anne the freedom of being loyal either to A or to B without calling her irresponsible. But incompleteness is a far cry from indifference. Actually, mathematically, very far cry. Um, incomplete says neither is the case A is at least as good as B, nor is the case that B is at least as good as A. And indifferent says both of them are true. It's almost exactly the opposite. Perhaps Ronnie has some argument why incompleteness of ranking is not permissible. Um, there have been such arguments in the literature, but none of which is even remotely convincing, I would argue. But more particularly, I did not see any such argument as I read the manuscript on the beaches of Circe, I could, of course, have missed something, even though I have to <laughs> confess I had greater freedom than Ulysses had on the same beach. <laughs> <laughs> Consider now a second case in which Beth is certain that there is, there is a unique way of ranking A and B, and the incompleteness of her ranking in her case of the pair AB is only tentative, not assertive. So she is not equilibrated on this, not now, nor in fact turns out ever, even though she works hard every morning on deciding what would make her life more successful and less wasted. So there's a lot of all this effort, as much as she could put in, but would these efforts qualify her for a pass mark and withdrawal of the accusa accusation of irresponsibility because her application is the maximum that she can provide. Consider now a third person, Carla, 
You'll be happy to see that, and know that it will end with D, actually. <laughs> Carla gives reason for the view that leading a life is such a super in such a super-disciplined way is itself a wasted opportunity. The big wisdom in making a life a success is not to think in those terms, but to go by spontaneous decisions. Even though on hi hindsight, Carla concedes, some of the chosen life bits may turn out to have been mistaken. Would Carla be irresponsible to, to herself if she followed one of Dworkin's demands by asking what would make her life successful, but not another about creating the lifestyle, that particular lifestyle that she has that uniquely most reason to do. And finally, we come to Dora, who thinks that it is itself very restless and silly to keep asking whether her life is being successful. There are so many interesting things to think about. <laughs> we should at least, she would, reasonably live without such an overriding concentration on self-assessment. She argues we have to recognize that assessment is itself a part, of, is a part of living. Even to keep assessing whether one is giving a quote-unquote a successful performance would itself be a part of a particular living style. And it is, Dora argues, not a particularly good living style. It's possible that all these cases can well be addressed within Dworkin's general framework, in which case I would like to hear more from him on these issues. Or if they really violate the demands that Ronnie imposes on personal responsibility to oneself, then I would like to hear from him why impose these demands in that form. As I said, I've taught joint classes with Ronnie in Oxford for 10 years, and I know that there are few things as enjoyable as hearing Ronnie defend his apparently implausible claims. <laughs> And I look forward to that pleasure. <laughs> <laughs>